Greetings all. Welcome to the Out of View with Professor Les Henry, where reason comes first. And today it is an honor and a privilege to welcome my special guest, Brother Levi Tafara. Brother Levi, how are you doing? Yeah, give thanks, man. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here reasoning with the eyes still. Yeah. You know? So, so um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, so for those that don't know, I, the name is Levi Tafari. Levi means unity. So about bringing people together. Tafari, creator to be feared, you know? So mm -hmm. you put the two together, creator of unity. Oh, wow. And, you know, so that's how I see things, you know? Yeah. So I was born and raised in Liverpool. Oh, well, well we, can, we can, hold on, we can forgive you for that one, yeah? <laughs> You're from Liverpool. You got anywhere in the world? <laughs> say you're from Liverpool, and nobody say where's that. It's true, guys. Only Liverpool and Brixton them know. Exactly. And and what is special as well, brother Les, is having Jamaican heritage and coming from Liverpool. So two places on the map that everybody love yeah. and know about. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So like yeah. I say, yeah. So I see myself as tricultural. Because I have an African root with a Caribbean heritage and a British experience. Mm -hmm. And those yeah. three things make I who I am. Yeah. So I don't divorce myself from any because it's I experience on this planet. Absolutely. So yeah, we can eat turkey and sawfish and we can eat, you know, fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> and we can eat some goosey soup and don't feel no way. True. So Indeed. that's how I see myself and that unity thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I would describe myself as a writer, performer, educator, and urban griot. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't know, the griot is a tradition coming out of West Africa, out of the African continent, mm -hmm. where you had a group of people, male and female, who are nomadic, who move from village to village, documenting orally the traditions, the history, you know, ceremonies. Um, they would give instruction. They would retain cultural identity. They would maintain the culture. Mm -hmm. And no session within Africa at that time was complete without a griot. Mm -hmm. And the traditions that we acknowledge now of rap music, and Jamaican DJ style, dance style, and dub poetry, jazz poetry. You know, all of these styles come from this tradition, the oral tradition. Yeah. And they used to play the chora and the drum. Mm -hmm. So I even have a lyric when we talk about the griot, you know, mm -hmm. play chora and the drum, you know, upholding I and I tradition. Mm -hmm. So that's how I see ourselves, you know. And, I start, what people don't realize also is that I'm a qualified chef. You know, okay. when I was a youth, between the age of 16, when I leave school, I went to catering college and studied classical French cuisine. What? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Classical French cuisine. French cuisine. You can't cook them <laughs> caca, caca, something, whatever. Caca, banan, caca, banan, something, and beef wellington. <laughs> <laughs> Son of this, <laughs> you know. So yeah, well, that's, so, a, that's a shocker for me, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have put that with you, and I don't want to say, you know, me expect if you just do some ital food, but yeah, I have put that there. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But yeah, but you know, I mean, in in work at, at one point, I, I did do the vegetarian meals for you know some of the guests still, because mm -hmm. most time. They have, you know, they're trying to imitate meat with vegetarian food. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of ingredients you can use that you don't imitate meat, that you just cook it as it is and it tasty. And mm -hmm. as you know, in Jamaica, you know, the Caribbean in general and Asia, we have plenty of spices. So mm -hmm. we can spice up things and make them taste nice the same way yeah, yeah, without yeah, yeah. trying to imitate meat. Yeah. But yeah. so I did that for a good six, seven years. And then with the advent of the American influence and the fast food thing, I decided no, I didn't want to do this anymore because people wanted burgers instead of steak. 
and there's no comparison. It's like somebody would, nobody would choose a Lada over Mercedes Benz. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I left that. And one of the reasons why I became a chef also, because when I was a youth, I wanted to travel. Because, you know, you're here in Liverpool, you're here in Britain, and you're facing isms and schisms. And I always thought I would like to see the world in case I wanted to dwell somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and it's ironic that it isn't through catering that I travel. It's through poetry, mm -hmm. which is something I used to write when I was at college. I, in fact, I started out DJing on a sound system. So, so hold, yeah. on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So you're a, you're a French cuisine cook. Mm. And you was a DJ? A DJ. We used to rap, well, toasting as we used to call it. Yeah, back yeah, then. yeah, yeah. And you had, um, we had two sound systems, Jaquamina Hi Fi and Crasher Hi Fi. Mm -hmm. And we used to do a little bit on it, but more with Jaquamina. Okay. And when I started college, I could no longer DJ because, you know, we used to have blues dance, or Shabin, as I'm used to call it. Mm. And in, uh, in, in Liverpool, the, the word Shabin is, is an Irish word mm -hmm. because, you know, Irish people and black people are treated the same. In mm -hmm. fact, Irish people are seen as black because the science said, uh, no blacks, no Irish, mm. no, no dogs. dogs. Yeah, no Jews, no Italians, depending on where you are. Where I, you yeah. are. Yeah. They used to get together and have these sessions because they weren't allowed in the clubs. And mm. the Irish name was... Shabin, which meant secret drinking place, because they didn't have a license to sell alcohol, mm, but yeah. I had alcohol here. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, we always thought that it was Shabin as in shove in. Oh, see. But when you say you're Shabin in. So that's why we actually thought that's what it was. And as you say, it was only later on that I, I got to realize that, you know, that is where it came from. But it, yeah, from how appropriate Irish. it was. Yeah, and as you know, Liverpool have a large Irish community mm -hmm. and a black community. But Liverpool, some people might know, have the oldest continual black community in in Europe, not just yeah. Britain. Yeah. So 1710, there's evidence of African families moving from what is now Pitt Street, which is in Chinatown, to what is now Parliament Street, which is in Liverpool. Late. Most people know it as toxic. Okay. 1710. Yeah. And remember, the union didn't come about till 1707, when England and Scotland joined together to go and invade America, wow. which is ironic what is happening now. True. Because people that ask the question, how oh, come America so racist and prejudiced? And you have to ask yourself, who went there and took it there? That's right. The British. The so Spanish yeah. and the French went down there yeah. because the indigenous people, the um, the Comanche, the Apache, the Navajo, the Sioux, you know, none of them, them never come with no ism. In, in, in fact, Bob Marley write the song Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. And, the, and he's talking about the African people that was there with the native people. Yeah. Because... Them used to rub them head and them said the here remind them of the buffalo. buffalo absolutely. Because although there's an alternative take on that, you know, where people where of course apparently Bob Marley realized that some of them, the Buffalo soldiers, I think they were the ninth cavalry or tenth cavalry, okay. something like that. Because myself and Brother Hakeem, when we do our one of our breakdowns, um called Django Unchained or Django Django oh, yeah. Unchained, and I can't remember something to do with that. <laughs> we look into that. But that's a, that's a crucial point. And I wanted to get to, you know, I wanted to just reason with you about how, the, how, how your culture has strengthened you and kind of, you know, kept you on this, this, yeah. this journey that you're on. Well, as a youth, I suppose late teens, we embraced Rastafari. And Rastafari I gave Ayman personally. You know, I love the way you say embrace. Because people used to say to me things like, ton Rasta. They say, you can't ton Rasta, because you're born Rasta. So it's either you're embrace Rasta, or you don't. If you yeah. overcome what Rastafari is. And beyond here. Exactly. Here. 
Yeah, so so I embrace Rastafari and it give I a foundation and a focus and a vision and an outlook on life, you know? Um, mm. That was conducive with who I am. Yeah. You know, so father from St. Anne's, Marcus Garvey country, a, mm -hmm. a place called Abuka. And in fact, Marcus Garvey used to go and preach in the village. And so that was strong political Garveyite. Mm -hmm. And then mother come from St. Catherine, you know, Riversdale, Kral, them side. Yeah, yeah. So it was dear in them, but saying that, them never liked the fact that I, man, you know, embrace Rastafari because they think we're going to come walk less and you're not going to yeah, do this, yeah. and do that, yeah. and you're just going to smoke weed. But then when I went to college and qualified, and when I went to college, I, I got a distinction, you know, yeah. because yeah. you could already cook. <laughs> Because, mm -hmm. as you know, most mom would of us will learn. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we grew up learning how to cook. This is how you do fried dumpling. Mm -hmm. When you make rice and peas, make sure you boil up the peas and then you put your coconut cream yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We, we know how to do them things. So when I went to college, it was a breeze. It was just to get the paper. Yeah. It's almost like a youth now where no off drive a car. But him don't pass him tests, so him don't have the license. Yeah, true. <laughs> so true, true. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so anyway, so that was that was our foundation, you know, the cage. And then like I said, with the advent of the American thing and British people wanting fast food and more convenience food, I just thought I didn't sign up for this. I yeah. wanted to cook properly. Mm. And like I said, I used to write. And a friend introduced I to the Liverpool Late Writers Workshop okay. because now I stopped the DJing because of the unsociable hours with the catering. Mm -hmm. I joined the Liverpool Late, Write Late Writers Workshop and yeah, they said, Levi, you're a good writer, man. I mean, the, the three leaders were Ken Shevans, who was a Jamaican veteran who fought for Britain during the Second World War. Oh. And he used to write. There was a white... Um, South African writer called David Evans and he was a member of the ANC mm -hmm. and he was in exile in Britain at the time. Well, he still is. I mean, mm -hmm. not in exile, but he lives here now. Mm -hmm. And Olive Rogers, who was a Liverpool uh, white woman, uh, I think of Irish descent. Mm -hmm. So as I saw it, I had three good leaders in terms of writing and mm -hmm. from different genres of writing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I start right and in the end, um, I did a performance for them and there was a, a guy there from the BBC and he filmed the performance and funny enough, it was a, a, um, it, it was a poem about the uprising in Liverpool, 81, mm -hmm. you know, um, called No Blame Rasta mm -hmm. and when I used to DJ, my favourite DJ and Tosa was big youth, Jai youth. I mm -hmm. love you, Raya, I love so much, but Jai youth, we'd only have to hear say Jai youth drop a tune. We wouldn't even have to hear the tune. Yeah. We'd go and yeah. buy it, you know? Yeah, I was like that, man. Zoom was a great influence, and the poem I did write was called No Blame Rasta, because the tabloids were saying that there was a, a a thousand rasters go on the rampage in Liverpool late in Tuesday. Walla, 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 brother Lever. A thousand rasters in Liverpool. In, in Liverpool. Year? What year? I don't, even, I don't even think there was 50. <laughs> Never mind. If there was a thousand rasters in the UK in that year. Exactly. <laughs> Let me write the poem. Um, the riots in the Liverpool, who is to blame? Please don't call the Rasta man's name. Because peace and love is the Rasta man's aim. So rioting is not the Rasta man's aim. The riots in the Liverpool, no blame Rasta. Oppression and injustice could never prosper. All over England is a total disaster. The burning and the looting. No blame Rasta. We did warn them not to arrest our friend. They never have no reason. So we warn them again. But reinforcements, what the police them send. No look how the situation it end. The riots in the live. And so and you forth. see the and you see, this is one of the things what I said, you know. I've said this to people from time. My mother, peace be upon her, she always used to say, 
You know, if you're supposed to be a wordsmith, you're supposed to be able to move people with a word, and the word is timeless. Because mm. you could drop that right now, and people would have just say, Wagwan. This the is exactly what is going on now. Yeah, because exactly. my mom always used to say, a teacher, a preacher, a singer, you know, a DJ, no matter, they should be able to move you with the word. And that is exactly what you've encapsulated there. Yeah. That's how you do it. So they quickly picked up on it. And then I wrote another piece, which was Black Roots in a Babylon. And it, it was, so out of that riot experience came, we, we used to have lots of um, cultural awakenings, mm -hmm. you know? And the Lado, we had teacher Dan, who come up from London, from Steel and Skin. Okay, you know? okay. We had the group Steel and Skin. Mm -hmm. They came to Liverpool. And then Cosmo, who I know the I know. Yeah, Cosmo. man, he was my first. I, I, I've known Cosmo from when I was 11. We used to sit with down him. and reason with him in Forest Steel. Yeah, yeah, man, a righteous brethren. And yeah, Cosmo man. come up and reason all groundation. And I and I as Russ that was there, as well as other people, you know, um, take part in the groundation. Mm -hmm. And then we brought up Queen Mother Moore, and she wow. gave a libation and set the thing. Mm -hmm. So I had to perform the poems in between the dancers getting changed from one costume into another. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny because the poem, as you said, timeless. Yasa Stafari, um, Kantap Dai, towards the end of last year, I said my daughter, dub poetry album, In I Your Face, of mm -hmm. which Ayman, Muta Baruga, Benjamin Zephaniah, um, Jean Binta Breeze, um, and, and, and some other poets, Yasso Stepanitsim, and poets from um, Canada and America, dub poets. Mm -hmm. My poem, this poem we write, like I said, 81, and fortunate to put some music to it back in the day. So I'm dig it out and I send it to him, and him love it. And again, like you said, the lyrics, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Culturally aware, a mystical African atmosphere, a cultural beat, and an African drum like the beat of the heart. Where life began, the black people roots in a Babylon, a positive vibration in a wicked land, a disciplined man in a disciplined land, a spiritual fight against wrong. Art and craft combined together, music and dance with the brothers and the sisters, natural living upon the earth, but in a Babylon, what is life really worth? Yeah. A concrete jungle where it is cool, a one could easily lose the soul, a place where the sun, it barely shines, and the smoking of the herb is a crime, a technical place <laughs> that is full of machine, where a one is not respected as a human being, if you have black skin, then say that is a sin, in a land of competition, black skin can't win, and it goes on. You know, it's really interesting because I know one of your one of one of the things that you're very strong about is this whole notion of the race. And you've kind of touched on that there when you're talking about the skin and the competition. So yeah. because I know you've got particular views on and just of I and I know we're in accord in this sense about this whole notion of race. Because race is not the problem, because race, sociology one oh one, race is a biological construct. It has no meaning whatsoever exactly it's construct so it's therefore racialization because race doesn't race isn't real you can't look at somebody and say they're inferior superior etc etc rubbish based on pseudoscience but That's we know right. that racialization as process and practice is real and i know you've got some i know you've got some thoughts on that, that yeah because oh i see it as it says race is a competition where somebody comes first, somebody comes second, somebody comes third, and sometimes people cheat. <laughs> so yeah. what they've done now <laughs> is that they based this competition based on skin tone, mm -hmm. which is melanin. And the more melanin you have, you know, the further back in the race you are. So it's played out first world, second world, third world. Yeah. You have first place, second place, and third place. True. The majority of the people in first place are white. 
first world people, Western. Mm -hmm. Then you have the second world, which is maybe the Eastern Bloc and yeah, Asia. Used to be the Slavic nations. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have third world, which is third place, you know, which is I and I, dark skinned mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. African mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. you know, Asian, some Asians, you know, Sri Lankans, dark. And what the people in first place have done in this race is shackled, shackled the feet of the people <laughs> who are in third place. Yeah. So when the race starts now, because the people, what, we, what people don't realize is that there were great African civilizations, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Kush, you know, Kemet, <clears throat> Nubia, mm -hmm. Dongai, Mali, mm -hmm. Ghana. Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. Azania, I mean, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. And they had all the resources. They wasn't just sitting around, they built up their thing. So the people who were in third place at the time, who didn't have anything, not even potatoes, because what well, Europeans don't realize, <laughs> potatoes come from South America, tomato mm -hmm. come from South America, mace came from South America, you know, palm oils and certain things came from Africa to mm -hmm. grease the engines to make industry happen. Mm -hmm. What they done, they went there, realized uh, they couldn't control at the time because they were great civilization. <laughs> so then pull a stunt now and put shackles on the feet. Now if you're in a race and you have shackles, you can't run fast. Mm -hmm. And the other people are flying. That's <laughs> so right. them fly literally, 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 literally. Yeah. yeah. Then, them get to certain parts of the planet now. So when them reaching what is now called America, they realize they couldn't do the work because the sun too hot. So they have to bring somebody else into the equation, i.e. I and I to do the work. So this whole thing about race and racial equality, it's a fleeting illusion because mm. it will never happen because the whole, as you said, construct of race wasn't designed to create equality. That's right. And like just to say, mm -hmm. until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is totally and you know abandoned. Yeah. You know, and they say there will be war. Yeah. From his majesty's you know? speech. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so that's all I see. So these were the things that drove me to mm -hmm. write poetry and like I said I used, I used to love the DJ but what I found with the DJ tradition which is still part of the oral tradition mm -hmm. is that the DJs and the toasters at the time used to take a popular rhythm you know and then would DJ over it so you know me big me broad me massive me hard me yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah yeah that would be a pretty but what the dub poets done was took the words and created the rhythm within the words. So mm. the music was in the words, you know? So dub, 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 dub. Poetry is poetry given to you in a this style. -y. This style -y come to set you free from political captivity that mm -hmm. keeps you down in poverty and controls you mentally. But mentally, we should be free. That's why I chant my poetry to reach the world spiritually, universally, and nationally. And so you can hear yeah. the rhythm. Yeah, yeah. Because then, and, and it's, it's interesting you say that because I know, you know, when I started DJing, N of 81 into 82, and, mm. and I'd, I'd been writing lyrics for about four years, but I never had the courage to like take up the mic and chat. But, you know, I used to get a whole heap of fight down because I used to write stories. Yes. And I didn't pretend I was a Jamaican. I hadn't been to Jamaica. I didn't go to Jamaica until I was 27 in 1985. So yes. I could only speak about London. You know, England, England, my born, England, my grow, London, my live, London, my know. Those were the kind of things I would do. <laughs> and I used to laugh yeah. after me, but, you know, I used to write stories. And, that, and this is what, for me, I have, I've always had in common with dub poets. You write a yeah. story as a start, a middle, and an end. It's like an essay. That's right. And, and that's, that's part of that real tradition. That yeah. is storytelling. Yeah. And it manifests itself through stories, poetry, 
certain narratives, you know? Yeah. And they're yeah. there to instruct and to delight. You know, poetry can make you fall in love. It can you can use it, you know, in a revolutionary yeah. way to raise people's in a protest poem. You can mm-hmm. write a poem that maintains the culture. Yeah, and in fact on that point, on talking about the protest thing, you know, a little bird told me that you, you worked with Maya Angelou. Yeah, man. Yeah, my sister Maya, as I used to call her. And it was interesting because at the time we had an Africa Arts Collective and we had a bookshop which sold, you know, African, Caribbean, Asian, and Latin, uh, or the Americas literature. And it was probably from a more from a black perspective. Mm-hmm. And we invited her to come to Liverpool, you know, one to kind of initiate the shop, open the shop and give it credibility mm-hmm. and to do a performance. And mm-hmm. at the time, she was with Virago, which is a female, a female publisher, isn't it? Yeah, because I've got quite a few of their books here, yeah. 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 And um, so Virago wanted somebody to introduce her when she did the performance at the Philharmonic Hall here in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women sent off their poetry. And somebody said to I one day, Levi, why don't you send some poems? And I said, well, I'm not a woman. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Mm-hmm. I don't want to take food out of anybody's mouth, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. If, if it's women, then it's women. And I said, no, man, no, send it. So they give me, I can't remember a surname, but I remember, I think the editor at the time was Lenny. You know, she was the person who run Virago. Mm. Um, with a couple of other women. And she contacted me and said, yeah, send some poems and we'll see what happened. So I sent out the poems and they sent them on to Sister Maya. And when she said my poetry, man, she said, that's the poet I want to introduce. <laughs> I get no cussing of her. I'm Ben Rasta, but it's not your fault. Well, exactly. No. So she, she arrived and she, she come to Liverpool and we give her a tour of the city. And you know what she said? There's a subtle form of apartheid operating wow. in this. City. Yeah. You could observe it because she's from Alkenstar. Yeah. You know, and she the running that was yeah. going on there. Yeah. Was going was harsh, but like she said, subtle. You know? Mm-hmm. So I built up a relationship with Sister Maya man. And she used to write to her, I used to write to her. And I have the letters there as a Heirloom, yeah. you know, one of the things when I'm a sister mayor, um, she was regal, man. You know, it's like meeting a queen, and I'm not name dropping her anything, but I've met the Queen of England, Elizabeth II, mm-hmm. and to I, there was no comparison. The queen I, Elizabeth II, just come in like a little short granddaughter, grandmother, you know, but Mayor Angelo had this presence about her, yeah. And she's yeah. quite a tall woman. Mm-hmm. And um, she reminded me of my Auntie Alva, my, my mother, eldest sister, because Auntie Alva was strong, you know, big yeah. woman. And, yeah. you know, she just, she just cut her eye after you and you just humble yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so Maya Angelo, yeah, she, she was, um, yeah, she was regal in that respect, you know? And, and didn't you, um, didn't you, Write a special did. poem to introduce her or something. That's right. So yeah. when she arrived, I decided uh, rather than just say, you know, I want to introduce you to a poet from America, from Arkansas. I thought, no, let me write a poem. And I wrote a poem about Sister Maya. And she loved the poem because we had to pass it by. Everything we had to pass by her first, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She loved the poem. So I wrote the poem called Sister Maya. Mm-hmm. And I delivered that poem to introduce her. And, um, and we, like I said, we remained friends. When she was 70, mm-hmm. she had a birthday celebration in, in Britain, in London. Mm-hmm. I think it was at the Hilton Hotel mm-hmm. in London. Or the Dodger, one of them big hotels. Mm-hmm. And she gave Senai, uh, you know, an invitation. Wow. To go and, you know, when it, it was beautiful, man. Angel Harriet was there, Jean Pinter Breeze, Diane Abbott, you know, um, Myra Stewart, 
um, they was blessed. River McDonald. It was yeah. it was like a black Hollywood, a British black Hollywood, <laughs> and everybody yeah. had a part to play. Like Jean wrote a poem mm. in her honor, and she read it out on stage. Ainsley was the compere, and he was bringing people in and out. And yeah, that's that, 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 that's, to me. That but that sounds like what someone should receive, someone of that stature. So this is what I'd like people to take away, you know, from this is that this whole notion of race is is a illusion, is a construct, it, it, it's a competition, you know, because the people in first place would not relinquish their power to the people in third place. So for example, Usain Bolt would never swap his gold medal for a bronze medal for the person who come third. And the person who comes second wouldn't swap their medal for the person in third place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole thing about race, I want people to recognize it's an illusion and people should come together and work together because we're a human family and not a race. So, so, so Brother I, Levi, I understand that if we go to Liverpool to a certain major museum, we see a massive plaque with one of your poems in there. And not only yeah. that, not only that, before you do that, I also heard, there yeah, come I do my little research, you know, come in, <laughs> Dr. Lazy, you know, Professor Lazy, see me? Yeah. I heard that you are something like, is it number four in the li in a list of 50 Liverpool greats behind, is it John Lennon and, and Paul McCartney? Yeah. <clears throat> what? There, there's, there's a wall of fame on the side of the central libraries, <clears throat> and you have... Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and, and then there's a, a female writer, and then Levi to far right. What? And it's funny, you know, because I didn't even know it was there, and people driving past and see my name and start beat them hard, and then phone me and say, Levi, you're on the wall of fame, man, in big gold letters. And when we go look, I was thinking I didn't matter which position I was in. <laughs> Last one, when there was just four names and I was number four, at least we make it. Yeah, but to be number four, you know, on this wall. And, and for me, you know, for me, sorry to cut you, but for me, that is such an honor. Not just for for the eye as a as an individual, but look at what that says about reggae music. Yeah, and the word. True, true. What does that really say? And then the other thing is about this plaque that's in. Mm -hmm. Is it in the said library then? It's in the said library when you go into central libraries, because central libraries had a big refurb about, I think, three, four years ago. Mm. And they put, they asked me if they could use one of my poems, which is called The Daughter of Merseyside. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about the things that Liverpool has achieved and done, and this notion of it just being known worldwide. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, they, I didn't even realize it was going to be so big. But the, the thing is huge when you go into the fire bit. You yeah. know, in fact, the way they've made it, there's some spiral stairs. If you go up the stairs and you look down, that is the main feature in the library. Wow. And it's in stone. And it, outside... Well, I mean, outside uh, that's, that's just... You know what, Brother Levi, that is just so amazing. I mean... You know, when we talk about, and I know me and you have had these conversations about immortality, that is what immortality is. Yes. True, That's true. placed in your mark. And not only that, anybody who looks into Levi Tafari, reggae, reggae, reggae musician, reggae performer, dub poet, you know, et cetera, mm. et cetera. I think it is such a, a wonderful accolade. It's an honor, man. It, like I said, apart from... Marrying my wife and yeah. having children yeah. is my greatest achievement. Yeah. No serious, because i tell you a quick story. <laughs> we were, I was doing something in the library and I took my granddaughter. She's 18 now, but she must have been, I don't know, let's say she was 10 at the time, um, or maybe a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And we took her to the, to the library. I didn't say anything to her, and we're walking, and she said, she called me Papa. She said, Papa, our name's on the floor in the library. Look, your name. And she was excited, man. Yeah. And yeah. it made me feel good. Because yeah. she 
he is two generations removed and she felt proud that That's her right. name, because her surname is Tafari, same way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. said, our oh, name is on the floor in the library and she started dancing. <laughs> Wait. Wait. Me good. But no, that's I the mean, blessing. But that is Brother Levi for me. That is the blessing. Yes, true, that true. Is the blessing. Yeah, that is the because blessing, it's and, it's, and it's it's eternal. Well, that's it. Because people talk about living forever and immortality and this, and they miss the point because everybody has a past. That's right. But you live through the Your things works. you leave behind. Yeah, you live through the works. You know, we talk about. Great African civilization, one name comes to mind, Tutankhamun. Mm -hmm. And look how long Tutankhamun lived, you know, thousands mm -hmm. of years ago. And, and, he, and he only lived to be 15 or 16. That's right. And people still talk about him. So that is immortality right there. You know, you know look up on Bob. You know, people, youths that wasn't even a twinkle in their parents' eye when Bob passed on, you know, moved. Mm -hmm. You know, to another dimension still. Yeah. yeah. And you love Bob Marley. Yeah. You, know, you live on you live on you live on through the works. You live on through your works. So yeah. that's what yeah. we're doing. We 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 do giving some works. And like I say, I've done plenty of television. I even appeared on Grain Jill. I'm a write mm -hmm. my part. <laughs> okay, yeah. There's only two of we that appear as ourselves on Grain Jill. Limford Christie in a yeah. sports day, and I went in on a literature day. Wow. And then I've done Blue Peter. We have two Blue Peter bags somewhere. <laughs> and then, probably, um, you know what? They're probably worth a fortune now. Well, tell me about it, man. They're probably, worth some, they're probably worth some shekels. People said, I'm going to buy them off me now, man. Again, they're dear. Yeah. But my children have been on Blue Peter as well. So in oh, this wow. house, yeah. we have about... I think we have four or five Blue Peter buds. Okay. But in the documentary where I went to Ethiopia, and mm -hmm. that, that again was something powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And, and for, I was a pilgrimage going there and meet Baba Shanti and 12 tribes and Naya Bingi. Mm -hmm. But you know, the reception, because, yeah. you know. Yeah, but you know, as we said, you see, to me, I mean, even deal with them probably there, because if they're not looking at what your works are, then they're a waste of space to me. And I've, and throughout my whole life, I've had that. And again, the overstanding comes from people like Cosmo, because Cosmo is the first one would tell you, forget about this, this now say nothing. Exactly. What is their works? What are the works they're manifesting? And the proof yeah. is in the pudding. Who is still on track now? Um, exactly. Well, Brother Levi Tafari, it's been great having you on the outer view where reason comes first. And what good, keep safe, Stay blessed, stay focused, and keep up the great works. Bye. Give thanks, brother Les. And likewise, you know, I know the I do some constructive works and some positive works. So, and I just feed off each other and just keep the fires burning. And that's why I say to people, keep the fires burning because mm -hmm. life is important. And, you know, it's just one life. And we need to... We need to work together to maintain that life and keep things moving forward. Forward mm. ever, backward, backward never. never. Rastafari lives. Yes, I Rastafari lives. True.